हेलो फ्रेंड्स सो दिस इज आर फर्स्ट टॉपिक सोर्सेस ऑफ एंसेंट इंडियन हिस्ट्री इट्स क्लियर फ्रॉम द टाइटल दैट वी जस्ट नीड टू रिमेंबर द सोर्सेज फ्रॉम विच वी डिराइव आर पास्ट दैट साउंड्स ईजियर बट गिवेन द वास्टनेस ऑफ द सोर्सेज एंड द फैक्ट्स इन्वॉल्व इट्स रैदर डिफिकल्ट राइट द पॉइंट इज वेन यू लर्न अ फ्यू स्कैटर्ड फैक्ट्स इट्स हार्ड टू रिमेंबर दैम but when the facts are placed in a form of maps and stories by creating meaningful links they are easy to remember one thing connects to another and one thing calls up another this is what we shall do in this history series narration of the past is based on a variety of sources scientific techniques environmental studies geological studies all these things provides a basis to verify and correlate various sources now before going into the sources we need to discuss about two alternative ways of looking into the past mythology and history while history is a representation of all the past occurrences that gives form to the world we live in today mythology is based on superstitions and legends it doesn't mean that these myths can't be true it's just that we don't have any strong evidence to prove them like for example would you have believed in dinosaurs if their fossils would have remained undiscovered I guess not. So that's about mythology and history. Now coming into the sources, broadly they can be classified under two main categories: literary and archaeological sources. The literary sources provide written records, not just on paper, but also those found on various objects like dried sheep or goat skin, copper, pillars and stones. While the archaeological sources are material evidence like the remains of monuments or ancient buildings, coins, pottery tool paintings etc for those periods in history where we do not have literary sources the archaeological findings play a significant role for example we have this indus script which has not yet been deciphered so in that case history is narrated through the archaeological sources again we have this primary and secondary sources of history primary sources provide direct or first hand evidence about an event person or an object these sources are contemporary to the events and people described the other one secondary sources provide second hand information and commentary from the researchers they interpret the primary sources you can say that secondary sources is the typical history book which may discuss a person event or any other historical topic now let us start with literary sources there has been much debate about uh, reliability of ancient indian literature since most of the ancient indian literature is uh, religious in nature some scholars have claimed that uh, the ancient indians did not possess a sense of history what these early uh, western scholars were looking for was chronology a clean narrative and dates in the indian texts what they found instead were fables rituals prayers etc however recent research into historical traditions has made it clear that different societies embody historical consciousness in different ways in the indian context for example we have poetry drama writings on religion philosophy linguistics mathematics and many other topics so let us have a look at these different categories of ancient indian literature in this video you can find a bird's eye view of all the facts the topics in detail will be covered in upcoming videos first comes the vedic literature these are the earliest known literature the word veda is derived from sanskrit root vid which means to know the vedas are said to have passed on through verbal transmission from one generation to the next this is the reason why they are also known as shruti literature so we can say that they are heard or revealed texts the vedic literature consists of three different classes of literary works samhitas brahmanas aranyakas and upanishads in some texts you might find four different classes instead of three but don't get confused by that they simply consider aranyakas and upanishads as uh, two different classes of works either way not an issue now the first subdivision of vedas are the samhitas samhita is a sanskrit word which means to arrange together in union these are the root words sam which means correct and proper and hita means arranged or wholesome the samhitas are simply a collection of mantras prayers and hymns to god it is the first and customarily the main part of the veda 
remember that samhita is not a teaching it is simply a collection of mantras i guess you know what mantra is this is what i found in the internet the definition of mantra you can go through it now the following four vedic samhitas are known to us rigveda samhita samveda samhita yajurveda samhita and atharva veda samhita do remember that the present form of samhitas clearly indicate that the collection is not a single work but consists of older and later elements this means that the whole work of samhitas was not prepared at a single point of time by a single family or someone so let us uh, get into the first samhita that is rigveda the rigveda represents the earliest sacred book of india it is the oldest and biggest among all the four vedas as you can see in this table The Rigveda Samhita is classified into 10 books called mandalas. Each mandala is divided into several sections called anuvakyas. Each anuvakya consists of number of hymns called suktas and each sukta is a group of mantra. Now every sukta has a rishi and a deity associated with it. The hymns and the verses circulate around the praise and worship of deities and have other thought provoking and philosophical context. This Rigvedic compilation is considered to be sacred and pious to this day and holds extreme importance in the Hindu culture. It is the precedence of all the religious texts that were written in the centuries to come. Next is the Samaveda Samhita. The Samaveda is the uh, Veda of melodies and chants. This is the shortest of all four Vedas. It is closely connected with the Rigveda. it is a fusion of older melodies and the rig verses in fact samaveda samhita is not meant to be read as a text it is like a musical score sheet that must be heard the samaveda is compiled exclusively for ritual application this is because its verses are all meant to be chanted at the time of ceremonies this is a fact that our indian music tradition in the north as well as in the south remembers and cherishes its origin in the samaveda Next is the Yajur Veda. Yajus means to worship and Veda means as you know knowledge. So Yajur Veda is devoted to the worship of gods. This Samhita primarily uh, contains prose mantras for worship rituals. It describes the way to perform religious rituals as well as sacred ceremonies. In simple terms, Yajur Veda can be understood as a book of rituals. it contains the technical mechanics of uh, sacred rituals and ceremonies now in this samhita we can also find some details about the principles of pranayama and uh, asana practice which are yogic teachings just like we discussed about samaveda which is in a poetry form this yajurveda is in prose form and this is divided into two parts the white yajurveda also known as shukla or pure and the black yajurveda also known as krishna or dark The Yajur Veda is also important for its presentation of philosophical doctrines. Many times it is quoted for depicting a religious and social life of Vedic people. It is also known for giving some geographical data. So it's a good literary source of ancient Indian history. Next is the Atharva Veda Samhita. The Atharva Veda is the youngest of the Veda quartet. In fact, for many years it wasn't considered a Veda. This was due to the fact that it seems to be embodied by a different kind of spirit. It's written in a more understandable form and paints a much clearer picture of Vedic history. Because of this, it is the second most important Veda in regard to history and sociology. The Atharva Veda is a guide on how to act auspiciously within the Hindu tradition. It is also said to contain a series of magical spells, charms and incantations. This also differentiates it from other Vedas which focus more on sacrifice and rituals. This Veda contain hymns uh, many of which were charms and magic spells which are meant to be pronounced by the person who seeks some benefit or more often by a sorcerer who would say it on his or her behalf. Legend has it that two groups of rishis the Atharvanas and Angirasa composed the Atharva Veda. This is why In older times this was also known as Atharvangirasa Samhita. Now this is also a fact. It is said to be the oldest literary monument of Indian medicine. It is believed to be the origin of Ayurveda, the Indian science of medicine. 
some medicinal plant names from the atharva veda and other vedas can be found in subsequent uh, ayurvedic literature okay so this is all about the four samhitas uh, this was a brief overview we shall discuss in detail while dealing with the vedic case chapter so next we have vedangas um, now as you can uh, guess from the name itself vedangas are six auxiliary disciplines associated with the study and understanding of the vedas these are the additional limbs or chapters in the vedas there are six vedangas which are listed below as you can see the shiksha and chandas are uh, aids for pronouncing and reciting vedic mantras correctly vyakarana and uh, nirukta are for understanding their meaning the jyotisha and kalpa provide appropriate uh, times and methods for performing the vedic sacrificial rites and rituals so the vedangas played an important role in maintaining the purity and integrity of the vedic tradition for centuries they taught and continue to teach vedic students how to recite the vedic hymns understand their meaning and perform the various rituals and ceremonies strictly according to the established procedures next we have the brahmanas with the passage of time the newer generations found the mantras of samhitas uh, difficult to understand an elaborate explanation of the mantras became necessary the result was the brahmanas the meaning of these hymns was therefore explained in the form of commentaries so the brahmanas simply present a digest of accumulated teachings which are illustrated by myth and legend they discuss on various topics on rituals and the hidden meanings of the sacred texts are also explained the third group is the aranyakas and upanishads the sanskrit word aranya means a forest the aranyakas were developed by the hermits living in the forests due to the limited sources of the forests they could not perform the conventional sacrifices nor could they adhere to the rituals it was then that the aranyakas were developed they are generally the concluding portions of the several brahmanas but on account of their distinct character contents and language they deserve to be reckoned as a distinct category of literature they are partly included in the brahmanas themselves but partly they are recognized as independent works as well with the advent of uh, aranyakas the emphasis on sacrificial uh, rites seemed to be diluting the shift towards philosophic and uh, spiritual interpretation of the rituals and ceremonials is evident next are the upanishads the upanishads are the final parts of the vedas this is why they are also referred to as the vedanta nature of the world and god is the essential theme of the upanishad so if we want to simplify the above discussion on the vedic literature in a single sentence we can say that the scheme of vedic learning is first studying and recitation of the hymns which is there in the samhita this is followed by performance of yagyas that is brahmana then an inquiry into the rational behind the performance of these yagyas which are described in the aranyakas and lastly an inquiry into the paramatma tattva and attaining its actual experience which is the vedanta or you can say upanishad so if the samhita is likened to a tree the brahmana are its flowers and aranyakas are uh, its fruit yet not ripened and upanishads are the ripe fruits so no need to worry uh, this is just a bird's eye view of the vedic literature we shall have a dedicated video discussing all the topics about vedic literature in detail now the important question is how this vedic literature helps in decoding the indian history the archaeological sources of the vedic age are practically non existent and therefore the only source of its culture and civilization is the vedic literature we can say that the vedic literature was as good as internet for ancient india up to some extent vedic literature can be called the foundation stone of hindu religion in india without it the hindu religion could not have established uh, with its rituals and laws so the early and later vedic literature gives us a vivid knowledge about the societal settings rituals laws and uh, learning process of our ancient india vedic literature is the best and scientific work of hindu literature and a good source of knowledge about india next is the kautilya's arthashastra the arthashastra is an indian treatise on politics economics military strategy the function of the state and social organization attributed to the philosopher and prime minister kautilya 
who is also known as Chanakya or Vishnugupta. So this Kautilya was instrumental in establishing the reign of great King Chandragupta Maurya. This Arthasastra is thought to have been written by Kautilya as a kind of handbook for Chandragupta instructing him in how to reign over a kingdom and encouraging direct action in addressing political concerns. The name of the work comes from the Sanskrit word Artha which means to aim and uh, Sastra implies a book or a treatise. And the goal of the work is a comprehensive understanding of statecraft which will enable a monarch to rule effectively. At first glance, the title Arthasastra is often translated to as uh, the science of politics. But Chanakya had a broader uh, scope and views. The book includes topic on nature of uh, government, law, civil and criminal court systems, economics, the methods for uh, screening ministers, diplomacy, theories on war and the duties and obligations of a king. Arthasastra also includes some aspects of Hindu philosophy ancient economic and cultural details on agriculture, mineralogy, mining and metals, animal husbandry, medicine, forests and wildlife. Though this book was written between 2nd century BC and 3rd century CE, its rules are still prominent even today and can be undoubtedly applied in today's systems too. Next are the epics. In India, the word epic brings in mind the two very famous works, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. The two great epics can also be used as a historical source. Amid the adventure of Hindu gods and heroes, we can find uh, different laws and regulations regarding caste, idolatry, sacred uh, places, festivals and superstitions. There are also educational passages offering an idea into the politics, morality, ethics and religion of that time. Though they are a part of religious uh, literature, they do provide information about different aspects of life of people of ancient India. In recent times, uh, some of the sites mentioned in both the epics have been excavated. For example, the Ayodhya excavations have revealed settlements going back to the northern uh, black polished ware period. Similarly, other places like the Hastinapur, Kurukshetra, Panipat, Mathura and all have been excavated and these dates back to the painted uh, grey ware period. So undoubtedly, both the epics uh, are a mine of information on how the religious sects were in integrated into the mainstream Hinduism. Next are the Puranas. Purana means belonging to ancient or older times. It is the name of an ancient Indian genre of Hindu or uh, Jain literature. They primarily are uh, post-Vedic texts containing a narrative of history of the universe from creation to destruction, genealogies of the kings, heroes and uh, demigods and descriptions of Hindu cosmology, philosophy and geography. Some of the ancient dynasties mentioned in the Puranas are the Haranyakas, Shishunagas, Nandas, Mauryas, Sungas and all. Also, there are certain kings mentioned with the names ending in the suffix Naga who ruled in the northern and central India. Interestingly, we do not know about these kings from any other source other than the Puranas. Besides, some geographical information on rivers, lakes, mountains are also found in the Puranas. That is why they are crucial for reconstructing the historical geography of ancient India. Next in line is the Sangam literature. Sangam literature is the name given to the earliest Tamil literature. The word Sangam literally means association. Here it implies an association of Tamil poets that flourished in ancient southern India. Sangams are said to be assemblies organized by the chiefs of three kingdoms of South India, which are the Chera, Chola and the Pandyas. Such Sangams were organized at the capital of uh, Pandya, that is Madurai. Now, historically, three Sangams are believed to have happened and today a lot of work is lost. But from whatever limited source we have at our hands, we can say that Sangam literature is the only source for knowing Sangam dynasties. Now this Sangam literature is not religious in nature. This is because the poets who came from all walks of life and included teachers, uh, merchants, carpenters, goldsmiths, blacksmiths, soldiers, ministers and kings. Due to their varied themes and authorship, they are a mine of information on everyday life of the people of their times. They constitute literature of highest quality. They describe many kings and dynasties of South India. The Sangam literature mentions many flourishing towns such as Kaveri Patnam. They also speak of Yavanas coming in their own vessels, purchasing pepper for gold 
and supplying wine and women slaves to the natives the mention of uh, names of some kings in the sangam literature uh, is also supported by inscriptions next literary sources are the biographies poetry and drama now early india is a repository of numerous masterpieces of drama and poetry the historians have used them to cull information on different times in which they were composed for example the great sanskrit poet kalidasa authored dramas like abhijana sakuntalam and poetic works such as uh, raghuvamsham meghadatam they all provide important insights into the social and cultural life of the guptas some of the narrative uh, literature includes panchatantra and uh, katha sarita sagara they are the collections of popular folk tales biographies of well known kings are an interesting piece of literature these were written by the court poets and writers in praise of their royal patrons for example banabhata's harsha charita talks about harsha vadana of the pushya bhuti dynasty it is the oldest surviving biography in india but from the historical point of view the rajatarangini by kalhana is the best illustration of history writing appreciated by modern historians his critical method of historical research and uh, impartial treatment of historical facts have earned him a great respect among the modern historians kalhana was a kashmiri brahmin and is regarded as kashmir's first historian his work is immensely valuable as a source of information on uh, early legends customs and the history of kashmir as well next and the important one are the buddhist and jain literature among the non brahmanical and non sanskrit sources of early india the buddhist and jain literature constitute an important category it was written in the pali and prakrit languages respectively prakrit was a form of sanskrit and early jain literature is mostly written in this language pali can be regarded as a form of prakrit which was used in the kingdom of magadha most of the early buddhist literature is written in pali like most faiths buddhism has its own set of sacred texts known as tripitaka and these uh, sacred buddhist texts comprise the teachings of buddha which is collectively known as dharma broken down into three sections each part of tripitaka carries the name pitaka or basket hence the westernized term three baskets said to have been composed after the death of buddha the pali texts uh, tripitakas tell us about the state of affairs of india at the time of buddha and the 16 mahajanapadas now let us briefly discuss about the tripitakas the first one is sutta patka it is held as one of the most important of three baskets uh, and it is also called as a discourse basket uh, which is believed to be a written collection of buddha's teachings included in this basket is the buddha's exposition on law which is also known as dhammapada it also includes uh, metta sutta a scripture in which uh, buddha describes how an individual can live a life of uh, loving kindness the next basket is the vinaya patka often called the discipline basket the vinaya patka comprises the collection of rules given to the community of buddhist believers in this patka there are rules and regulations uh, which the buddhist congregation of believers called the sangha are required to follow with hundreds of rules about basic morality and even a few on how to dress it's a sort of buddhist code of conduct now the last one is the abhidhamma pitaka which is also known as the philosophy basket this is often referred to as a scholastic or a philosophical almost scientific description of reality in its pages uh, you can find the theories and description of uh, things like the nature of time the workings of human mind and even the state of matter now among the buddhist literature we can also find the theragatha and therigatha which are the verses which were narrated by early members of buddhist sangha therigatha is the first surviving poetry in india which is supposed to have been composed by women hence it is important for not only buddhism but also for gender studies if you go through the therigatha you can see that the writing strongly uh, support the view that women are equal to men in terms of spiritual attainment now these things are uh, quite important why because while uh, writing essays in the upsc mains examination you can quote these things so next is the jain literature the jain literature constitutes another important category of texts which contain information uh, that help us in reconstructing the history of different regions of ancient india 
we can use the jain literature for information on history and doctrine of uh, jainism doctrines of the rival schools life stories of saints and lives of monks in the jain sangha okay so here the literary sources of ancient indian history have come to an end now let us have a look at the archaeological sources we know that archaeology is simply the study of human history and prehistory through the excavation of sites and the analysis of artifacts and other physical remains archaeological methods like excavation and exploration are important as they provide significant amount of data on our trade state of economy societal aspects religion and other aspects like how people lived ate and clothed themselves in the indian context the excavations have provided immense amount of uh, data throwing light on paleolithic mesolithic uh, neolithic iron age and uh, many other cultures for example till the 1920s it was held that the indian civilization began around uh, 6th century bc but with the excavations of mohenjo-daro and uh, harappa the antiquity of indian civilization has gone back to around uh, 5000 bc The findings of the prehistoric artifacts have shown that human activities had started here as early as uh, 2 million years ago. Similarly, it was believed that most of the Indian subcontinent came to be populated only around the later part of the 1st millennium BC. But now with the help of archaeology, we know that it was populated uh, sparsely and thickly right from the stone age periods. So I have created a playlist on how different archaeological methods are adopted and used to decipher the historic timelines. You can find the playlist link in the description box below. Next is the coins. Coins form another source of historical information. This is partly because unlike most other ancient artifacts, they are often stamped with words and images. Now how to define a coin? It is simply a metal currency that has a definite shape, size and weight standard. It also bears the stamp of the issuing authority. Now remember this, the side of the coin which carries the message is called obverse and the opposite uh, side is called uh, reverse. In the Indian history, the Indus Valley civilization is considered as the first wave of urbanization. Now the archaeological evidence of coinage was found in the second urbanization period that is around 6th century BC. You see study of uh, numismatics from the Indian perspective is also important for UPSC preparation. You can check out this question which was asked in the mains 2017. How do you justify the view that the level of excellence of the Gupta numismatic art is not at all noticeable in the later times? In fact, it's not just about coins. You cannot mark a particular topic important and avoid others. So a holistic preparation approach is recommended. Okay so about the coins the earliest coins in the subcontinent are the punch mark coins these coins are called punch mark because uh, of their manufacturing technique these coins were mostly made of silver and uh, these bore symbols uh, each of which was punched on the coin with a separate punch some gold punch mark coins are also reported but uh, uh, they are very rare and their authenticity is doubtful now these are the features of uh, punch mark coins Uh, the punch mark coins bear only symbols on them each symbol is punched separately which sometimes overlaps one another these have been found throughout the country from takshila to magadha to mysore or even further south they do not bear any inscription or legend on them with the expansion of magadhan empire the magadhan type uh, punch mark coins replaced those which were issued by other states slowly the punch mark coins were replaced with dynastic coins now we do not have the exact uh, date of uh, issue of these regular dynastic coins however the earliest of these coins relate to those of the uh, indo greeks the saka pallavas and the kushanas these coins are uh, generally placed between the 2nd century bc and 2nd century ad Now there are evidences where uh, hundreds of coin molds have been found uh, dating back to the Kushan period. This implies that uh, there was some increase in commerce during this time. Here you can see the map of ancient India uh, in the 2nd century CE showing the extent of Kushan empire uh, during the reign of Kanishka. Now here is an uh, early gold coin of Kanishka 1. You can see this obverse and uh, reverse side. Uh, you can see here the kanishka standing clad in heavy kushan coat and long boots so the kushanas uh, issued their coins mostly in gold and copper and rarely in silver 
their coins are found in most part of north india up to the present day bihar the kushan coins uh, generally depict iconographic uh, forms drawn from greek mesopotamian and uh, zoroastrian and indian mythology shiva buddha and uh, kartika were the major indian deities portrayed kushan gold coins influenced subsequent issues notably those of the guptas next came the mauryas who punch marked their coins with a royal uh, standard so we have uh, discussed about arthashastra earlier which was written by chanakya the prime minister to the first mauryan emperor chandragupta maurya in his book there are references to minting of coins such as rupya rupa which is a silver coin and swarna rupa which is a gold coin after the mauryas the indo greek kushan kings came and introduced the greek custom of uh, engraving portrait heads on coins their example was followed for 8 centuries thereafter the guptas uh, who ruled between 4th to 6th centuries ad appeared to have succeeded the kushanas in the tradition of minting coins they completely indianized their coinage they also issued a number of gold coins known as dinaras they were well executed and die struck coins the gupta coins followed the tradition of kushanas depicting the king on the obverse and a deity on the reverse the deities were indian and the legends were in brahmi script the earliest gupta coins are attributed to samudra gupta chandragupta 2 and kumara gupta and their coins often commemorate uh, dynastic succession as well as significant socio political events like marriage alliances horse sacrifice etc here is an example from the rba website uh, showing the coins of guptas next is about the south indian coinage as you can see in this example the symbols and motifs on the south indian coin issues were confined to the dynastic crests such as boar tiger fish bow and arrow lion etc for example the adavas of devagiri issued padma tankas with an eight petaled lotus on the obverse and a blank reverse coin legends refer to names or titles of the issuer in local scripts and languages in the south indian coins decorative features are rare and uh, divinities are almost absent till the medieval uh, vijayanagar period in the post gupta period the gold coins declined in number and purity by 12th century ad the turkish sultans of uh, delhi had replaced the royal designs of indian kings with islamic calligraphy the currency made in gold silver and copper was now referred to as tanka with lower valued coins being called jittals The Delhi Sultanate also attempted to standardize the monetary system by issuing coins of different values. So this is a typical uh, representation of the coin issued by Delhi Sultanate. But the defining moment in the evolution of the present day rupee occurred when after defeating Humayun, Sher Shah Suri set up a new civic and military administration. He issued a coin of silver weighing 178 grams which was termed as rupiah and this was divided into 40 copper pieces or paisa. the silver coin remained in use during the remaining mughal period so this is the brief evolutionary history of coins in the indian subcontinent we shall deal this topic in detail in another video next in line are the inscriptions inscriptions are nothing but words that are written or cut into something hard uh, like a rock or wood for example they are considered most reliable source of ancient indian history as they are generally devoid of myths and narrate the facts this is because although we have a huge number of literary uh, sources they are mostly religious and suffer from chronological problem the advantage with the inscriptions uh, among the literary sources is that uh, it comes in the exact form it was composed in and engraved for the first time it is almost impossible to add something to it at a later stage as we generally find with the literary works now the study of inscriptions is called epigraphy As on date, the earliest uh, deciphered inscriptions are the Ashokan edicts, which have been found on the rock surfaces and stone pillars all throughout the subcontinent. The Ashokan inscriptions are a class in itself. Recorded in different years of his reign, they are called edicts because they are in the form of king's order or desire. They also give a glimpse of his image and personality as a benevolent king concerned with the welfare of not only his subjects but also the entire humanity. Now do remember that Ashoka was the third king of the Mauryan Empire. The edicts were inscribed throughout Ashoka's realm which included the areas of modern day Afghanistan, Bangladesh, India, Nepal and Pakistan and most were written in Brahmi script. Also we have several thousand inscriptions in the form of royal land grants engraved on copper plates. 
These are donative uh, documents which record grants of land and other items to the brahmanas and other beneficiaries. Though these uh, land grant uh, inscriptions deal with the sale or uh, donations of land, most of the times they contain also details of genealogy of uh, donors and uh, other economic information. Thus they become a great source of political, social and economic history. From these uh, land grant uh, inscriptions, we also came to know about the grants of land free from all the taxes to the brahmanas. These were called the agraharas. Now there are some inscriptions which praise their patrons or kings. Some examples are the Hatigumpha inscription of Kharavela, the first century king of Kalinga and the Allabhat pillar inscription of Gupta king Samudra Gupta. Besides above, some inscriptions record the construction of dam, reservoir tank, well or charitable feeding houses etc. So from the above discussion, uh, we know that uh, the inscriptions are a good source of political, social and economic history. They are a valuable source for the historians since uh, they cannot be tampered uh, very easily and they also tell us about contemporary events and common people. Their spread is taken as an indicator of uh, reigning king's domain. So this is all about the inscriptions. Next is about the monuments. We know that temples and uh, sculptures are found all over the country right from the Gupta period up to recent times. These show the architectural and artistic history and achievements of Indian culture. Monuments are quite important because they give us many details such as the style and designs prevalent at that time, the type of materials, building techniques, uh, purpose of the said monument, historical events surrounding the monument, the political environment and so on. These are some of the basic and uh, simple reasons as to why monuments are important source of ancient Indian history. We know that many travelers came to India as pilgrims, uh, traders, settlers, soldiers and ambassadors. They have left behind accounts of places they have visited and things they saw. If studied with due caution, these accounts give a lot of valuable historical information. In fact, the foreign accounts uh, supplement the indigenous literature. You can go through these uh, facts, some of the foreigners who visited India and uh, their accounts are quite useful in discovering the Indian history. So these are all about the literary and archaeological uh, sources of ancient Indian history. Remember that uh, none of the literary sources, whether native or foreign in origin, especially those of ancient India, must be taken at its face value. As far as possible, a historian must corroborate uh, the picture he builds from these uh, sources with non-literary ones like the archaeological remains, coins and inscriptions. So this was an introductory video just to give you a brief idea about the sources of ancient Indian history. In the following videos, uh, these uh, sources will be uh, discussed in detail as we come across them uh, chronologically and slowly you will get uh, familiarized about uh, these different words and chronology of different events and all. So that's it guys for today. Hope you found this lecture useful. Stay tuned to this channel for more such videos. You can have a look at some of these keywords which uh, we have discussed today. Have a nice day.